We got Mitchell Pierce here. Thanks for coming, Mitchell. Nice, no thanks, boys. Uh, good to be on board. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, he's our ambassador, and you can tip against him. Him and me are going terrible in the tipping. Actually, I've been struggling bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard, man. It is hard at the moment the way the comp is. It's, it's not easy. What well, was the first round? It was um, only one, one favourite one. Yeah, uh, in in round one. So pick the margins tough too. Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, I just, just go such for a blowout with the scores now as well. I, I just go for twelve now every time. Twelve oh, yeah. points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seems, seems to take bookies about five or six weeks to work out what's what as well with the tipping and yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I'm getting smashed. Like, like I've won my personal tipping comp last. No, sorry. So I'll tell a lie. Two years ago, I came tied equal first, oh, yeah. but the other guy beat me on margin. Yeah. But I win it every year, and this year I'm coming fourth or something. It's, yeah. Oh, the comps are so up and down. You just don't know what, who's going to turn up each week. How did the Bulldogs beat the Roosters? Exactly, yeah. I didn't pick that one. <laughs> I think that's, that, that's what lost me this week, yeah. last week. <laughs> I think the 11 players and Tedesco and Walker HIOs helped help the dogs a bit. But Yeah. Anyway. Well, the dogs, are, they're, 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 they're thereabouts. They're not too far off, I think, if they can mm. get a bit of momentum over the next you know, little period. They're, oh, they're one of those teams where I can even get a bit of confidence. They've got enough individual players that they mm. can sort of come up with something so well, it's just one of those years yeah. poor titans though sides well, like that you just <laughs> can't see too much improvement in this, them at the moment. we talked mm. about the titans like when you look across the they always like i'm not detracting from the quality of players or the fact that those guys are nrl players but the when you rate the individual players or the entire team with the players against all the other teams titans have like the worst team yeah Des has to attract some big star power they've yeah. got you know tino who's out yeah they got david Fafita. Um, but then the rest of them, they don't have like heaps of strike. Kieran Foran, obviously, you're good friends with Kieran yep, Foran, Kieran, yeah. yeah. So he's so good, but he's yeah. at the yeah, back end of his career. Um, I don't, I don't see anything for the Titans this year. Yeah, I just thought, I thought they would have been better than what they were. I think yeah. everyone did. Um, I know you said they got a few players mm. out, but they have, they, they've had a decent success the last couple of years. Like they've been there about sort of eighth or ninth for the yeah. roster they had. Um, yeah, it's sort of come out of the blue that mm. sort of uh, early form from them but such a long year that you sort of don't remember by the end of the season and you look back no one remembers probably the first six seven rounds yeah. <laughs> we're in the we're in the moment at the moment yeah. obviously but then as the year goes on you sort of you see sides that'll get a bit of late wind as yeah. the year goes on so who knows they might come good let's pray for them <laughs> well, Newcastle did oh, it last sorry. year yeah you know Newcastle did it last year they were 15th or whatever after the sixth or seventh round and then yeah. 10 wins in a row yeah. Pretty easy to do. Yeah, exactly. Well it's just confidence in this comp, isn't it, too? And then some of the sides that might be lurking on the bottom of the eight, you know, they have a couple of injuries and all of a sudden they fall away after some really good form. So you see it every year. I think um this middle part of the season around Origins normally the most important part. Um, you know, with players in and out, some players going into origin, if you don't win the series or you do win, their mood can can change coming back to their sides. So I reckon this, you know, round eight to around 15 is usually the 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 determines a big part of the year yeah that's yeah definitely like i think uh, Parramatta is a good example you know they've had good form they lost a couple of players and now they're in a bit of bit of strife we'll see how they go Mm. in the next few rounds but mitch moses out for a long time Mm. um can they manage that that period you're talking about it's gonna that'll determine whether they make the eight actually well the para one's a big one i did their game for triple m on the weekend um and they just their whole side one to 17 look really flat. I think that can happen sometimes when you take a, a best player out of a team, you know, for a couple of weeks, you can either rebound and the guy that comes in plays some really good form and gives them a, f- a fresh energy. Parramatta sort of went the other way, I think, the last couple of weeks where they've, you know, they lost direction and they looked really legless on the weekend. Yeah. So, but they've got a big roster there and some big forwards, so they just need to change the way they play, I reckon. But you expect um, them to be up the top of the ladder with the, with the roster, yeah. got, even without Mitch. Was it uh, was it a quick no when they rang you and asked you if you if you're interested in um, in joining the Eels and, and filling a gap there left by that injury to Mitch Moses? Yeah, well, it was, mate, it was pretty funny that even we're still talking about it because um, <laughs> I got a random phone call and I sort of touched on it before, but um, it was kind of the way it came up was just inquiring, and then now how it always does it got out in the media. Um, mm. I hadn't really said anything to anyone, I don't think. <laughs> Not that I remembered. <laughs> Um, and then next minute there was talk that I was reaching out to them. So I was a bit blown away by the whole thing. But 
as you can see, boys, I'm going to go get involved in maybe some jiu-jitsu and uh, I'm happily retired sitting <laughs> yeah. on these podcasts. So uh, playing footy at the moment would be the last thing on my mind. Were, were, were you flattered by the approach, though, even though you, you, you knocked it back? Were you flattered that they, they reached out and... And they're interested in signing. Oh, it's always uh, it's always nice, isn't it? Yeah. If you, especially when you're retired and you've been <laughs> overseas, to, to people to someone to think that that way of you. So you got to take that as a compliment. But it was a quick no. Yeah. There's only five current halfbacks in the NRL who've um, played in a premiership winning team. And if you had of decided to, re- to to join the Eels, you would have been the sixth. So yeah, right. you can see why that they reached out and made the approach. There's very few halfbacks around who have that experience of winning a premiership. So yeah, That's um, a good, interesting stat, isn't it? There's, it was, everyone yeah, keeps talking about the shortage of, yeah, of, um, of yeah. halves at the moment. Yeah, who so are yeah, they? Nathan Cleary, Jerome Hughes, Chad Townsend, <coughs> Adam Reynolds, Daly Cherry Evans. So yeah. you would have been the sixth if yeah. you had to join the Eels. Yeah, it was just... There's, there's obviously the... It's the way it's going. Everyone's talking about the lack of halves at the moment, and there's some good ones coming through. I think Katoa out at the Dolphins. Yeah, he's um, he's a Penrith kid, I think. Went to a private school. I think he was playing union on a scholarship for a while, and then now he's sort of found his way back. Got a, I think they're looking to sign him for a long term yeah. term deal. So I think he's one of the the best of the young crew coming through. So there's some good halves coming through, but. As we always say, you've got to give them time to develop. Mm. But to win a competition now, you can't see many of those other sides. Just look at those names. You can't see mm. many sides winning without you know, one of those five this year, I don't think. Mm. In those big matches, big moments, those are the guys that, that you need and to rely on. I can't see... Well, the one that stands out, Nathan Cleary, I don't think anyone's better than him at the no. moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. and you just you just kind <clears> of... <throat> I mean, Parramatta, there's, they're a big club in Sydney. They're a well-supported club. They haven't won a premiership since 1986. You sort of go, look, I, I just don't want to deal with the pressure of having to, you know, come back and, and fill in for Mitch Moses there. You, you know what I mean? You'd sort of... <laughs> yeah. Like, imagine, can you imagine the, you know, the, the, the fans? they just jump on you at any opportunity, wouldn't they? Be able to hide into nothing, wouldn't I? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I honestly still am laughing because it's still funny that I'm, we're talking about it. In, yeah, uh, yeah. in the fact that uh, it was pretty funny how it kind of flared up. But the, as you said, it's good to be relevant even when you're finished. And <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think there's a more under pressure halfback in rugby league than the Parramatta one every year because they're still comparing him to Peter Sterling. <laughs> yeah. Still stuck in the 80s, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. Sterling yeah. must feel like Superman, which he was, but yeah. his name still gets brought up on every season yeah, as every a half. Season. They haven't had a good later. halfback since Peter Sterling. He was a pretty pretty good player, wasn't he, Sterling? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I was just going to ask what, what you're up to at the moment, Mitch. I've seen you sort of doing the rounds in the media. You went on the Matty Johns podcast. You went on the Sunday footy show. Yep. Um, is that something you're sort of interested in? You're interested in a, a media career long term, or have you thought about coaching, or what, what are your plans sort of going forward now? Well, the media thing just sort of um, opened the door, just sort of opened mm. up. I came back and I got an opportunity, so I'm doing mainly Triple M. Oh, um, cool. I'm commentating on the weekends, so I'm getting to watch plenty of footy, and cool. um, and I'm doing a podcast on a Monday with Todd Carney. Yeah. Um, so we've so we both got an opportunity with Triple M, which I'm really enjoying, and. Um, a good team there um, but the, yeah it wasn't something I, I retired and thought I want to go straight into media um, but I do I mean, it keeps you keeps you involved with the game I look forward to it, it gives you a bit of purpose for weekends and, and keeps you involved um, but yeah my bigger purpose is I want to get into some mentoring um, in rugby league and away from rugby league I've got a, a friend of mine an older lady that's involved in uh, the mental side of stuff and where we're going to work on something hopefully to, to, to build into as I said, all parts, not just sport, and I'll probably do a bit of coaching in the development stuff as well. Um, I suppose I've done it for my whole life, and it's sort of what my skill set is. So, um, you know, and I'm passionate about, especially with with young halves, trying to give back all the knowledge that I learn over the years. So that, that that mentoring, would you sort of look to do that sort of in conjunction with the NRL, or would you sort of be looking to go to individual clubs and, and look at doing that? The... Um, it's only early days. We're sort of just working on some stuff, and it wouldn't be really to do with the NRL. It'd be sort of a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, we'll just wait and see how how that pans out. But that's sort of a passion. You want to get to a point, don't you, where it's about giving back and and and, and opening up. Um, your skill set and trying to help people and that's that's something that I'm passionate about obviously I've been through a fair bit good and bad in my career and um, you know you, you learn lessons as I just said good and bad and it'd be nice to, to you know give back in these next few years 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go way back to um, 2007. You're 17 years old. You make your NRL debut. Um, how did that feel being sort of thrust into the spotlight at that very young age and the fact that you, you, you've got such a famous father um, who, who played at the highest level as well? Did that, did that sort of help you in the initial stages um, deal with that, that, that pressure of first grade early on? Yeah, well, it all just came really quick. Um... I played Australian schoolboys the year before, captain of the Australian schoolboys. We went over to tr tour around Europe, <clears throat> and uh, I got player of the series on that. So I came back. I'd already signed with the Roosters by then. So I was playing Jersey Flag, uh, which was 21s back then. <laughs> so I was only 16 playing Jersey Flag. So I was playing. I was used to playing older boys. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Stewart, uh, I've mentioned a fair few times over my career. He was the, the reason I went to the Roosters. He was the coach there. Um, obviously, very influential guy, old half halfback, an absolute legend. And uh, when you go and have a meeting with Sticky and at a club like the Roosters, and he says he really wants you, and he sees, you know, fast tracking you, um, that was the big lure for me to go there. And um, yeah, things moved really fast. Sticky actually got sacked uh, before I went into the full time squad. <laughs> <laughs> so. I ended up linking back up with him in Origin and stuff like that, and he was always a big fan of me, which was great. Um, I had a good relation, relationship with him, a lot of respect for Sticky. Um, but Chris Anderson was my first coach and gave me a start at 17. Um, I didn't expect it that early. I sort of came back into pre-season and um, just got stuck into training and just wanted to you know, head down, ass up, trying to earn some respect. And, um, you know, connected with the, with the older lads pretty early, and, and I got a start um, probably too early in hindsight, but... You're not going to knock it back, are you? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, what, what was the best advice your dad gave you in those early stages? Um, did, did he give you a, a good... I'm, I'm guessing he gave you a good indication of what to expect. Yeah, my dad's leadership as a father's always been... He's never been someone to, to shove things down my throat. Um, if anything, dad kind of pulled away a lot uh, and let me sort of have time to breathe as a kid. I didn't play rugby league till I was 10, so... I. Since I was four or five, I was around Balmain, around the sheds at Leichhardt every weekend at home games. That was sort of my upbringing growing up. Um, so I just loved rugby league, you know, if, um, maybe because of dad's influence or it was just in the blood. Um, but everything I did was with a footy in my hand. But they wouldn't let me play until I was, I was 10. So I played soccer, which I actually think in hindsight is great for any kid because it, it teaches you a lot of different skills, especially as a halfback. So, oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think it's... Um, and dad, dad was, uh, yeah, they were really against me playing rugby league at the start. I think he just wanted me to, to know that I, he wanted to know that I genuinely loved the game and I wasn't just playing for him and all this sort of stuff. But I kept knocking on the door and then I finally played and um, I started at North Ride Hawks in, in the Balmain comp. Um, and, and yeah, footy was um, all I cared about at that age. And then dad's guidance wasn't always, like I said, it wasn't shoving things down my throat. He was always there if I needed him. But I think my dad's influence is just watching the guy and um, mm. growing up with him and just the standards he sets for our family and everyone around him. He's just a leader. He's a, he's a mm. hard worker. And I just pick up on those things subconsciously. And it's not till you get a bit older, you realise that influence of, you know, how blessed I was to have just that male figure with just such, such a hard work ethic and, and a champion. So it's taught me everything I know. Yeah, and I guess having seen your dad sort of speak publicly here and there, he seems like a very laid-back sort of guy who w wouldn't have heaped a lot of pressure on you. Yeah. You sort of get that impression of your dad, you know, from the outside looking in anyway. Yeah, it was funny though. Actually, I was in uh, thinking about little things that the way he sort of led led me or his his way of showing you the ropes. So I used to do athletics a lot when I was a kid. I was a pretty good runner, so yeah. I did 800s and 400s and I went to nationals and that type of stuff around 14, 15. And I was the only kid to go and, go and do visualisation before. So dad, dad would take me and I'd go into warm-up and it was never like for show or anything. We'd go to like this under a tree 15 metres away, 15 minutes away, but he'd be doing these breathing things. And it's not till now I realised what, what, what he was helping me with and we'd go on there and he'd talk me through and visualise me winning the race and all this sort of stuff. So to get that kind of access or that sort of leadership at that age like I think back on those little things now and there was a, there was a lot of things growing up that he helped me with um, but that that specifically I remember I'm like that's pretty cool that you get that <laughs> that kind of coaching when you're when you're 14 going into an athletics um, 
in, in an athletics competition. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. And then there was another time, actually, I used to go to the gym with Dad and everyone knows how good a trainer he was with his weights and everything like that. And um, I was such a little competitive prick when I was young as well. <laughs> But, you know, Dad was probably, this was when I was 15. So he was only just coming out of his playing day. So he was still a beast, you know, the way he'd throw weights around. <laughs> and I used to spit the dummy in the gym a few times and walk out because I couldn't keep up with him in the, in the gym. <laughs> and he grabbed me a few times and, and gave me a fair spray about spitting the dummy. So <laughs> um, I tell people that story as well because I was 14, 15 and undeveloped trying to keep up with the big fella. So. <laughs> that, man, you're overtaking me eventually, right? Because he gets old. <laughs> That's the thing. Like I'm starting to get him now. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. He doesn't like that. No, it's a yeah. I had it with my kid as well. We were doing training and it'd be like we'd be doing the leg press and I'd be on like 250 and then it's like, all right, your turn, 120. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd hate to be your son because you'd just be squeezing his head off. No, he's better, he's better than me. <laughs> That's a different type of yeah. endurance, that one. That's what they always say because like, I, I train a lot of kids, man. And like I, I always Sometimes I do mean things to them and then everyone goes, you wait till they're like 17, 18. And they're gonna bash you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, hopefully I'm 50 by then, and they can't pick on an old man. All that, all that suppressed anger from all you <laughs> squeezing their heads off. They're just gonna try, and, try and get you. <laughs> yeah, they're all smart asses, so they all deserve it. But yeah. yeah, wait till they're like 15, 16, 17. They start to develop like man muscles yeah. and start beating the crap out of me. But like I said, I hope by then I'm like 50. So if they do mean stuff to me, then it's the other way. Why are you picking on an old man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can use that excuse. Yeah. Yeah. I'm old man, I'm old. Come yeah. on, be nice to me. Yeah. But yeah, like it's it's um that's really cool, man. Like having your dad is basically helping you with that kind of stuff because that's one of the things I go through with kids in coaching, like yeah. the visualization. And a lot of young people actually look at that stuff and go, "That's just stupid," mm. you know. Like it just sounds oh, stupid. No. Yeah, but then. I always say, like, guys like Michael Jordan talk about it. Mm. And if someone like Michael Jordan is talking about it, then you've got to pay attention to it. Yeah. So it's really cool to be introduced to it by, like, having a professional for a dad is awesome. <laughs> well, you, you create feelings, don't you? They talk about the visualisation, and you'd know with, with combat sport, but it's been a massive part of my career, visualisation, and um, it, it's, it's real. And yeah. if, if kids out there don't believe in it, we, you need to start believing in it because... Um, I was lucky that I got exposed to it early, and then I, I met another guy as I was as I got older in my career. There was a big uh, influence in in the mental side of things, and you do the, the feelings that you feel before a game is what you create the way you play. Yeah, like if, if you've scored a try before, or you've done a nice pass before, or a kick, you can recreate those feelings. And as you know, in sport, all these great champions talk about it that. You need to be in that that feeling and that frame of mind that you've already done it to create it. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? And I can vouch for that. I've seen pl plenty of times in my career when I've I've played good footy, um, and you're going into a game, you know, and you're already creating how you want to feel, and it, it yeah. generally happens. So yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Competition mindset heaps important. I actually like one time I did a internal comp at my gym in Jiu Jitsu and. I had to go up against a guy who I never beat on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I roll with him, like, almost every day. I've never beaten him. He submits me all the time, and then I beat him in comp. Yeah, right. And then he was under. He was asking me, like, why? And I was like, because it was just that competition mindset. I thought about winning. I visualized winning, and I just sent it and went, and that was it. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I wasn't really prepared for that. I just thought it would be a normal kind of situation where I just go in and go, like, oh, I always win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's like the comp being able to enter the competition and make sure you have those feelings of, like, this is how I should feel when I win. I get Definitely. a lot of guys who are always going on about how nervous they are, and I always tell them like, you have to visualize the end, not concentrate on the now. Like, concentrate on what's gonna, what, how you're gonna feel. Yeah. Visualize how you're gonna submit that person and stuff like that. Well, it's a full time job, isn't it? Too like, um, and that's the thing that younger kids need to know. Like, you, like you just said, you don't just rock up and play. Yeah, you, you're creating it through every action you're doing every every day. Like, and it'd be the same in all sports, I'm sure. With no doubt, it is. Um, you know, that's the thing with professional sport. And when you finish, you realize straight away now I've got a bit of, like you can breathe because everything is is, is so structured, isn't it? And yeah. to play your best footy every week, you know, you have your down times, it's a great life and there's plenty of massage and recovery, but that's all part of that bigger picture to play well at the end of the week. And your mind needs to always be, as you said, in a clear mindset and, and, and trying to manifest what you want to do at the end of the week. So, yeah, professional sport's such a, uh, all-in mentality uh, and you can't go half-assed that's for sure
Yeah, that's all I, I, you know, we're supposed to be talking about you, but let's talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's one of the things that with Jiu Jitsu, you know, we were talking about it before. When I first started, there was very few people doing it, and now there's so many more. And there are three people trying to become professionals. And I had um, Jake O'Driscoll on last week. We were talking yeah. about the difference between professionals and an amateur athletes who call themselves professionals. Yeah. So we have, I know, like lots of people who train twice a day and get their name printed on their rash guard mm. and say, I'm a professional. But then you look at gyms that have actual professional programs where they're taught doing not just like we're going to rock up and roll, we're going to talk about visualization, we're going to work on like our breathing exercises, recovery, everything. Mm. And those gyms are the ones that are vastly excelling over everyone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's like four or five gyms in Australia that are just becoming like world class gyms. Yeah, wow. um, even there's a uh, one at uh, Penrith Sydney West Martial Arts where. Um, one of their athletes, Josh Saunders, he used to play rugby league in under 21s. Oh, yeah. And then he changed to jiu-jitsu and he's like in three years, he's, he's now brown belt, like in three years. It normally takes eight years and he got it in three years. He's performed on the world stage and stuff. And yeah. it's all about that fact that he's got that experience of what the difference is between a professional athlete yeah. and somebody who just does it. And he's been in that system, I suppose. Yeah. You know? So he's brought like a lot of his knowledge and experience that you would have had the same kind of experiences into the jiu-jitsu game at his gym and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah, I'm just sort of fast forwarding a little bit to uh, to 2010, your fourth season. And you, you're playing the grand season. final. I'm a Dragons fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry for bringing that up. The rain. Uh, so <laughs> is that, it wasn't too good. That was a bit more. So we'll that just, was too good. So we'll just Way fast forward another few years and go to 2013. Um, <laughs> winning that premiership in 2013, um, that was just huge. It was massive. It did that experience in 2010 of coming up a bit short? How much did that help you in 2013, do you think? Oh, everything, I think. Um, yeah, I've spoken about that a lot um, in reviews of the 13 grand final. I remember how nervous I was and the whole team. You just go into a sheds, and as, as you know, in all sports, there's a feeling that you can feel when everyone's on and in the zone. And in 13, you could just feel like you could pop the balloon with the intensity in the, sh in the sheds. It was just that feeling like they were going to have to play or just smack us with every baseball, but they had to to take this prize away from us sort of thing. And the Manly, I'm sure, would have been saying the exact same thing. So the game itself was was one of the hardest games I've played in. Um, we went in front, oh, sorry, Manly went in front, we went in front, then Manly got a start, mm. and then we ended up chasing back the win in the second half. So um, I think from losing in 2010, when it was more of a momentum season, we were all young kids, and you sort of, not grateful just to be there, but you don't understand the ma the magnitude of a grand final mm. where we were at that age. You think it's going to mm. happen all the time. Mm. Uh, it's a bit of a regret thinking back because I wish I realised at that time what was it. So it's hard to hard to put into words. You know what's at stake, but it's just the the feeling was just different because we were younger mm. and mm. the second time around, um, I just knew like this may never happen again and we have to win this. Uh, mm. But yeah, the feeling you get out of those trophies, you know, like mm. we had. I was, I was unfortunate I was overseas um, for the reunion this year, but like the brother, the, those, those brotherhood that you get in those teams, um, you know, you just, it just, it just, when you see the players from those, those, those teams and, and, and what you went through, it's just, a, it's lifelong friendships and um, yeah, I'll never forget that day. Yeah, maybe that, ex I mean, no one ever wants to lose a grand final, of course, but maybe that experience of losing one in 2010, maybe that really helped you sort of, um, I guess grasp the significance of a grand final when when you went again in 2013 and and got the job done. Yeah, I think it's just yeah that feeling of of losing. Yeah. You know, you don't want that feeling again. And like I said, you don't know when they're going to come around. I think Dragons were probably in the same sort of position we were in in 13. They were in that position in 2010. And they were too good for us. They were the the, the best side all year. Um, defensively, they were just so rock hard. Um, and they were they were they were a hard side that year. They were the Melbourne Storm of that few years. When we compare them to Melbourne Storm, obviously with the way they defended and that professionalism, when Wayne was there, as you know, as a Dragons fan, they were they were a great side. And uh, Jamie Soward had a big year that year with his kicking game. Yeah. Ben Hornby was a great leader. Um, yeah, they were too good for us. But yeah, plenty of lessons out of that year. Um, and then 13 came around, and mm. I'm just grateful we won because. Yeah, and, wouldn't you, want to lose another one. Yeah, yeah, and, and you didn't have, as you said before, you didn't have it all your own way. Down eighteen eight in that second yeah. half, came back to win twenty six eighteen. So yeah, 
Yeah, well, that was really thing. good to be composed under that pressure like that. Yeah, well, we did well to, to to claw our way back into the game. Obviously, we had so many good players in that team. I was only Michael Jennings is playing his three yep. hundredth tonight, which I'm I'm super proud of him. I played with Jenko in junior rep footy, um, and then all at the Roosters days, and he, he's still he's one of the best players I've ever played with. I say that to everyone. Um, just his instincts, and he was just one of those kids when he was coming through. It was just too good. Um, but yeah, he was an example that year. We had Sonny, James Maloney, like mm. the whole team. Yeah. When you needed a big moment, you just look across the board. We had the yeah. best players. And, um, and, <laughs> that's, yeah. You finish your career and you just, it's things like this, you know, you, mm. you think back and it's, it's so special to have played in teams like that. Like you don't get that very often and the quality we had and the, and the, the personalities too. We just, everyone was so humble, but just together all the time. And in big moments, we just had, 13 players putting their hand up and that's such a special team to be involved in and those three players you just mentioned Sonny, Bill, Maloney and Jennings that was their first season at the club as yeah, well yeah. and so obviously those three had an immediate impact there and you know del- helping to deliver a title in their first season at the club yeah because there was a lot of change I remember well, Jimmy had signed earlier um, he was one of those ones that signed like a year in advance. Yeah. yeah. So the club had sort of he signed from the Warriors. Um, so we all knew Jimmy was coming, and what, and uh, I was excited about that. Obviously, knowing the quality of him, we we formed a really good combo. But Sonny, Jenko, uh, there was one other one, Luke O'Donnell. Oh yeah. He yeah. was an old head who was great for us that year. Uh, he was like the big brother to everyone. Uh, we were all sort of still. Most of us were sort of middle mid twenties where. Uh, Donsky was the, was the old dog, and um, so yeah, the, the players that came in that we picked up late, really, um, obviously, were, were a big reason for the success that year, and mm-hmm. yeah, good memories, making me smile now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, right. I yeah. can remind you about 2010 if you want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Min- Minicello, Daniel Tupo, Jennings, Roger Tuivasa-Sheck, <sighs> Maloney, JWH, Jake Friend, Sonny Bill. Boyd Cordner, Daniel Mortimer, and like you said, Luke O'Donnell. Yeah. It's a star-studded team, that yeah. one. If you look at the Manly roster, they were nearly as good. Yeah. Or probably as good. Yeah. Like, they had all the, the Manly sides, probably one of the best dynasties Manly's had. Yeah. Um, in the, in, through the 2000s, when the, the Stewart yeah. boys, Chockey Watmo, Kieran, Cherry Evans. Um, mm. So, yeah, any time. The hardest game I played against Manly was actually the semi, which, which earned us the, the week off. It was 4-0. And everyone thinks, like, if you told someone now at the pub, you, you won 4 nil. they'd think it was a shit game but that game was no, probably was the best so attack I've been involved in it was just so both teams were just that good in defence like it wasn't a, a game where it was just one out and, and bad kicks it was like a high quality game and mm. there was just no stoppages and it was it was a 4 nil game like mm. if anyone ever gets a chance to go watch you got to watch that game back for the for the mm. how good both sides were on paper and that, that Manly side you're talking about, so they'd come off premierships in 2008 and 2011. So in 2013, they still had the bulk of those players yeah. still there. That the team that won two premierships. Yeah, yeah. So clearly not not easy opponents um, in a grand final. Nah, they were, yeah, like I said there, both both sides, every time we came up against Manly, we knew but it was both world-class rosters. Uh, they had great halves in Kieran and, and Cherry. So me and Jimmy were always wanted to get over the top of them and... Yeah, just across the board, both sides were, were top shelf. And like, even as a fan, even when I was playing, I loved watching Manly play. Like, those sides that they had, and I played with a few of them in rep footy, but you know, they were old school footy boys, like the Stewart boys, Chucky Watmo. They they lived hard, I think, and they and they just played just as hard and, and they delivered. They won so many, well, they win two comps there while they were there. Played in maybe three or four grand finals, was it? Yeah, 07, they played in the grand final. Um... Yeah, it was, I think it was 07, 08, 2011 they were in grand finals, 2013 they were in the grand yeah. final. Um, yeah. Yeah, so they were, they, were, they were red hot um, through that through the early 2000s there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to bring up this, um, I guess, your departure from the Roosters at the end of, um, of 2017. Um, did you maybe sort of feel a little bit like they they didn't show you enough loyalty at that time, and you'd been a loyal servant to the club for eleven seasons? Um, I mean, I know, I know, I won't shy away from it. I know Cooper Cronk won those two premierships when he got there, but did that, that at that time did that upset you a little bit that they didn't show you more loyalty? Oh yeah, I've said it before. At the time, you di- mm. you're disappointed yeah. because you're a yeah. competitor. But I've also said, in hindsight, now I can totally understand what the club was doing. 
Um, and they went and went on and won two comps. And Cooper was a better player than me and a, and a better winner. I'm, I'm the first to say that. And I can, you know, you finish your career and you just see things for what they are. And I'm really happy with with where my career was. Um, I went on to Newcastle, which was a different experience. I also laugh about it too that when you finish it. The trophies you look at in the cabinet, all look the same. <laughs> it all looks the same. So maybe if I had stayed there and played off the bench, I might have had a few to my name. <laughs> but um, at the time, it was just my reaction was was wanting to go on a new um, new journey. Mm. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed at the time, but mm. in time also you, you realise um, it is what it is, and 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 the club made a great choice. And, and um, Cooper's an out and out champion and got the results there. So, uh, look, I've still got a good, really good relationship with the Roosters. Um, one thing about the Roosters, if you're a player that's that's uh, delivered there and been there for a long time, they're a very loyal club um, to their old players. And since I've left and um, and moved on, Nick's always been a real big support. So I've got nothing but nice things to say about the Chooks. Yeah. Um that um, was a, I read some quotes from Cooper Cronk at that time, and he actually said how much he actually wanted to play with you at the Roosters. <laughs> did you? Did you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry but did, did, did you? Um, did you give that serious consideration, or you just thought, no, if Cronk's coming here, I'm, I'm, I'm going? No, it wasn't that black and white. Um, as you can imagine, around those times, there's emotion. Uh, when there's big choices and, and then you hear different things and, and there's, a, as there's a big change. I'd been there for a long time. So um, the, I was obviously looked into all options, um, but there was there's a few clubs that were interested, which when you've had a bit of a kick in the backside and a bit of a disappointment to, to see that there's other options, you naturally want to, uh, you're curious, you want to investigate. Mm-hmm. And then that's what I did. And then it, it just felt right at the time in my heart at that time in my life um, to try something different. And the reason I went <coughs> went to Newcastle was it was something different than what I've been used to. The other clubs, I spoke about it as well, but um, obviously Melbourne, I've said it, Cameron Smith reached out, <laughs> which was quite ironic at the time. Um, and there was a genuine opportunity there, but it just it fell through with, with the salary cap and the, and the top 30. Um, so I always pinch myself a little bit there if, if I had gone down there and how that would have panned out. Um, I definitely think I would have been a better player going down playing that off the back of, of Billy and, and, and Cam Smith there. Uh, so that was a really special feeling at the time when, when I had the conversation with, with Smithy. Um, but yeah, the Newcastle, I drove to Newcastle and I'd been living in Sydney all my life. Um, Newey was a, a rebuilding club. Um, they were excited. They had all these, um, a bit of money and, and they were recruiting players and there was all this uh, excitement around it. And it was a bit of a weight, pressure of weight off the shoulders a bit for me. Like I'd gone from the Roosters where if we had a fell short, um, there was always a lot of criticism and I enjoyed all that for a long time, but it was just a bit of a weight off the shoulders and that's why I went to Newcastle. Yeah, um, I've, I've actually digged up an old quote from you about your, uh, your experience <laughs> at Newcastle. I um, remember saying it. <laughs> you, said, you said this and I quote, um, without being corny, you genuinely feel a higher purpose of playing for this town. You feel that here. That's the difference between the Knights and Sydney clubs. So uh, there's a real sense there that you really enjoyed the idea of getting out of Sydney and all, all the pressure with Sydney and the fishbowl that being an NRL in, NRL player in Sydney brings. Yeah, well, I, I, mean, I still I still think the same. Um, that's not nothing personal against Sydney clubs. It was just when you go to Newcastle, there's a, there's a higher purpose there that you're playing for the whole community, uh, and you only have to see the the crowds that Newcastle get. They played last week um, in the pissing down rain against the yeah. your boys, yeah. the Dragons, <laughs> and they had ten thousand loyal fans there, uh, and you feel that when you walk around. It's it's got a bit of um, North England Europe. Football vibes there, you know. Everyone cares so much about the team. Um, it's a working class town where everyone loves rugby league. So yeah, I felt felt that higher purpose when I was there. And um, you know, anyone who gets an opportunity to play in Newcastle, it's it's a great place to play footy. Yeah, and you guided them to two finals appearance there appearances there in 2020 and 2021. And that finals appearance in 2020 was their first time in the final since 2013. So you, you had an impact there for sure. 
Yeah, it was just the first two years are probably my most enjoyable I had there because um, I got back into Origin actually in 19. So I played some really good footy in those first two years and I linked up with Kalen Ponga uh, the first year. And as I said, I was coming from a club where we were top two every year and um, it, was, it was awesome, but it was a different experience and there was a lot of younger guys and the style of footy we were playing was really refreshing. So um, those first two years, uh, we didn't make finals, but actually got injured the first year we we're, were going close we we're actually playing pretty good footy but um yeah i just really enjoyed my footy there and it was a different style of footy um so in hindsight the move to Newey um w was a good move i had a had a good time um met plenty of good people and it's a great club um so yeah you, t you take bits and pieces out of all your experiences and um you know i, I can't speak highly enough of both clubs that i've been at yeah, um, so you finished your, your NRL career with over 300 games. Only, since the competition started in 1908, that's 116 years ago, only 50 players have played 300 first-grade games or more. So that's a very exclusive club that you're a member of. That was special. Um, you, know, to, to, I never, you never set out to, to say, I want to play 200, 300 games. <clears throat> you know, as a kid, you just, you're one day at a time and... Um, I was, I, I was, my 200 was really special because I was the youngest player ever to play 200 games. Uh, and now, when I suppose when you finish your career, I'm very, very grateful for that, the durability that I was able to have. My body held up. You know, there's plenty of players that have been better than me that haven't been able to put that much footy together purely because their bodies fall apart and different reasons. So just to be able to have a body that could get through a lot of footy, uh, I'm grateful for. Um, and that obviously led me to, to the 300 and. It's just a special week playing uh, in front of your family and friends and, and obviously all your old teammates um, reaching out to you. And um, I am very grateful that I got to, to play in that 300 club because there's, there's not too many players that have played in it. Yeah. yeah. Some others who were in it, Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk, Darren Lockyer, Terry Lamb, Steve Menzies, Paul Gallen, Benji Marshall, Brad Fittler, Cliff Lyons, Nathan Hindmarsh, Andrew Eddingshausen. Jonathan Thurston, Billy Slater, Hazamil Masri, J Daly Cherry Evans, Brett Kamali, and your mates, Anthony Minicello and JWH. Yep. So, what about Jared, eh? 300 and yeah, in the going. front row, unbelievable. But yeah. yeah, like when you look at it like that, it makes you feel pretty humbled, doesn't it? Um, so I ended up, I went overseas to the Super League and played, I ended up playing 350 all up. So with the, with the Super League games as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, like I said though, I just, you know, Playing football is one thing, and then having your body hold ups another thing. And um, I've always been professional with the way I've approached my training and stuff, but it does take a bit of luck, I suppose, or genetics to to, to get you through that much footy. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, um, in, in 2021, um, Andrew Johns um, was on a podcast, and he was asked where you sit in regards to NRL halfbacks of the past decade between 2010 and 2021. And he had you at number three. He wow. had you in front of Daly Cherry Evans. Wow. So that's um, that, that, that's quite the accolade from he, the he, immortal himself. He's yeah, done it before, the lack of halves now. It's kind of like that was the – there's in the early 2000s up to the middle 2015, 2017, we had like Andrew Johns, Brad Fittler, yeah. Jonathan Thurston, Cooper Cronk, Mitchell Pearce, Benji Marshall, so many halves that were all like – Superstars, yeah. all of them superstars, and we don't have that many now. Mm. What What do you think changed? Because now we do actually. What I kind of find is we have every single club almost has a superstar fullback now. Yeah, yeah. But not very many have a superstar halfback. So there's a few reasons, and there's been a lot of talk around this lately. I'm actually pretty passionate to to get into a sort of academy to do. Um, sort of a halves academy. Me and Todd Carney have linked back up. We've all be, always been yeah, great mates. Todd Carney, superstar half. Yeah, Toddy, mate. Toddy was a great player. We yeah. won a Dally M, and um, Toddy is one of the most natural players I've played with. Um, and I, I think a lot of players would say the same thing. Obviously, had a few dramas here and there off the field, but from a pure, skillful, uh, brilliant player, Toddy was was one of the best. But uh, we're really passionate about getting back into the, the roots, the, the grass roots, and doing the development around halves. Because when I came through and you asked the question about all these elite halfbacks, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. But when I was coming through there, you'd had your, your superstars, like you said, your Andrew Johns's, Darren Lockyer's, these guys that are immortals. And then even the second tier, there was always a lot of talent 
like if you looked at these players, you could model a lot of the stuff off, off their yeah. game. Um, now you probably look at the game, and there's probably five or six that are really solid elite halves, and then the bottom's a bit more manufactured. Um, there's a lot of talk around you here, Joey and Maddie and stuff. Um, speak a lot about this subject for me I think the, the way it's coached in the juniors now has changed a lot a lot of coaching is, is around and, and it's a bit to do with the, the size of the kids now um, as well so there's a lot more of the power running through the middle type style but um, I think the coaches a lot are trying to coach all this structure and coach all this um, trying to copy what an NRL team does mm. it takes away that sort of touch football instinct like I mean when, when I was coming through the juniors and me and Kieran Foran grew up together and a lot of us was just all about practicing our skill set, like how far we could pass the ball, how, how we could work on beating this guy to get to that guy to play a short ball. Like I'm sure kids are still working on that, but it's becoming a lot more around game plans and this type of stuff. So I think that's one definitely a big reason. Um, it's hard to sort of pinpoint any other reason. Um, why? Because every team still needs a halfback in the juniors. Yes. <laughs> so it doesn't sort of make too much sense, but I think the size thing, everyone talks about that as well. I think that's a big thing. Because I think the other thing as well, you can have you can have a really talented kid that might not be the toughest kid, but he can develop the toughness later. But he's got the skill set that's better than most of these other kids. But if he's not prepared to sort of ride it, ride the wave, 14, 15, 16, 17, and deal with, you know, maybe his bit of weakness that he's not as tough. Mm-hmm. If he gets through that and develops that later, you'll see a really quality player at the end of it. It's probably the same in the fight game, I'm sure. 100%. Where there's probably some kid that's really talented. You could speak more than me, obviously, about it. But there might be a kid that's really talented in the wrestle, but he's not as hard as a, a young Brazilian kid, for instance, or something. But in time, you might see his best days ahead of him with practice and coaching. Um, so I think we're losing a lot of players before they get that opportunity. Um, and, I, and I saw, I think the NRL is implementing some stuff in and around uh, Oz Tag yep. and Touch Footy, trying to develop that that stuff a bit more because um, you know develop skill set and, and and not lose kids because of fear. So, but it's a worry. We, you want these kind of players to keep developing because otherwise, the whole style of the game in ten years might completely change yeah, well, if we don't keep developing. You know, skillful halves. Yeah, that's the the highlights are. You know, that you see when they do put together marketing packages of halfbacks and fullbacks doing amazing things yeah. in attack and forwards doing amazing things in defence, you know, and, and it just seems like we don't really have as much. I'm just a massive fan of rugby league. I've been following it since I was like eight years old. Yep. Um, we don't really have as much awesome halfback kind of highlights anymore. Yep. That's what I notice a lot. Like we get a lot of those uh, aerodynamic fly through the air, Xavier Coat style tries. Yep. Um, Dom Young flying through the air and like getting the ball down, but there's none of those really awesome halfback plays that we see in highlight reels anymore. No. And I just noticed, you know, they started talking about it at the beginning of the year and a little bit last year, but I've just noticed more and more and more. There's only like, like you said, like five superstar halves now, mm-hmm. and then a bunch of halves. Whereas only ten years ago, like every single team had at least one superstar half and then another that was like that second tier level. Definitely. There wasn't any that were just like, okay, well, we just got him at half back. It's true what you're saying though. Like the fullbacks now, like you could you could pick 10 fullbacks off yeah. the top of your head now that are out and out could play rep footy. Mm. Or if, if an Australian yeah, fullback went team. down, you could probably say, you know, Edwards, Teddy, Turbo, like they're just three off the top of my head that would easily go into an Australian team mm. and play just as good as each other yeah. in form. Mm. The hookers, there's a lot of nines that are really solid now. Outside backs is probably the biggest, best outside backs I've seen in the game yeah. for a long time. Yeah, they're like, also massive. They're massive. Well, that's <laughs> one thing that's good to be retired. And when when over yeah. the Super League and came back, like I look at the outside backs now, like just making your tackles on them in the arm wrestle is a hard enough job. Like, yeah. They're just so big and strong. So the game's developing so many players like that. But yeah, I'm you know as a, as the next half, you're passionate and you're loyal to your halves and. Uh, you want to see them keep developing for sure because like you just said, you know, when I was coming through, the thing that drew me to the game, Andrew Johns was my favourite player. Yeah. Um, and I was, I could sit there for hours just watching the way Joey moved, his hip movements, the way he passed. That's all I did as a kid and it was just, that was that was what you idolised. So you just, you hope that they can keep developing um, over the next 10 years so we keep seeing that type of player because it makes for a better product too. If, you, yeah. if you're playing rugby league's build off, you know, you want good halves that throw the ball around and ask questions of the defence. You don't want, you know, Nathan Cleary is setting the benchmark for that. Cherry Evans still playing great footy. There's still mm-hmm. plenty of good, really high quality, great halfbacks. But 
some of these teams are just really struggling to put sets together because they don't have that halfback. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Bulldogs supporter and, and um, they, they, they keep talking about, oh, the, the Bulldogs need a halfback, they need a halfback. But they're, they're hard to recruit. I mean, they're not going to get Cleary away from Penrith, obviously. They're yeah. not going to get DCE away from Manly. They're not going to get Munster away from Melbourne. Yeah. So it, it's it's really, really difficult. It, it, you know, it, it sounds easy enough. I'll just recruit a halfback. But there's just... Yeah. There's just no sort of suitable candidates available to, to yeah. sign. And it, it affects the team, as you said, the Dogs fan. But I think the other thing is too, though, which is a worry, but teams have got to change the way they play if you don't have that type of player. Mm. I think a lot of... And it's, it's only natural. that You see these, these ball-playing locks now with Yoey. Um, Victor Radley plays a little bit like that. And then obviously with Nathan. But all these teams that have those players can play this style of footy, mm. you know play with layers and, and skill set and all this sort of stuff. But these other sides that are sort of trying to manufacture playing that sort of style and they don't have the players, it just looks like they're legless sometimes, doesn't it? Mm. And, and their attacks just doesn't flow. So there's a, big, there's a big thing around also, I think, if you don't have that type of player and we're not going to keep develop, developing them, you need to change the way you play, um, which isn't as easy as it, as it sounds, I suppose. But you, you do, you feel for some of these sides, don't you? You watch, they, they haven't got a half leading them around and they're just playing off their middles. And the halves are getting criticised, but what do you expect? So, yeah, that, it's that, difficult. Yeah, and just that that, that rule where you, you get the seven tackles on the twenty if if you kick it dead. I mean, that's stopping these teams from really going on the attack with a kick on the last. A lot of teams who, who don't have that potency in attack, a lot of them are just going to ground. Yeah. yeah. Um, seeing out the six tackles. That's boring it, to watch, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because they, they don't want yeah, to take, so they, they don't want to take that risk with that kick on the last yeah. and risk giving up the seven tackle set. Yeah. Um, Which affects the product. Yeah. You know, it's mm. not what you you don't go to watch yeah. the game and watch people get tackled on the last tackle. You want to mm. watch the skill set. So I think the the yeah. change this year as well, that short dropout change, it's yeah. made it even worse. Yeah. Like this this end of set, if they're inside the ten, they don't want to do anything. They just take the tackle because yeah. even if you do get a repeat set they, everyone's getting the ball back anyway. Yeah, I don't mind the short dropout. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, I don't mind it because it's, I suppose it encourages maybe a bit of unpredictability. So if you're just kicking the ball long every time, um, yeah, I, I don't mind. There's, there's a lot of rule changes though, isn't there? Yeah. Like That one personally, I, I don't mind. But I just, I like, I, the I game's just getting so quick, mate. That's the thing. The game's just become so quick. And that's what I noticed before I left. Um with the six agains now, like you could be on the back end of three me. six agains and you're making 18 tackles. Like it's so hard to stop, especially we just spoke about all these big outside backs yeah. and these big middles coming off the bench. Like they're hard to tackle. I was at a Sharks-Dragons game, I think two years ago, and the Dragons got like 12 points up on the back of six again. Yep. And then the Sharks finally got the ball back after like 15 minutes and got like three or four six agains in a row and they went up. They score again. <laughs> yeah. They went ahead and then the Dragons got it back and got a few in a row and went ahead. Yeah. And I was like, I couldn't imagine making all those tackles like over and over and over yeah. again. I do wrestling, like yesterday I did five two-minute rounds yeah. and at the end of it that was it like i'm done i gotta go home and sleep yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i can't imagine doing it for 80 minutes you yeah, know like yeah. making all those tackles yeah and that's the six again rule i, I know the the um and i really trying to encourage the attack like that's the kind of thing that's their thoughts about everything but when you combine it all uh, like my favorite team ever obviously was the 2010 dragons mm. and it was because of what you're talking about before like the back of that that defense was ridiculous yeah it was just crazy for anyone to break through. And then then Jamie Soward would kick those super long yeah. punts and then they just defend the ball over. And I really loved watching it like that. And I used to have these arguments with people where they'd say, it's so boring because no one scores. Yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, but the defense is so good. The mm. attack isn't bad for yeah. the other teams. The attack yeah. looks really good. It's just... I think the defense is still a priority. Yeah. Like mm. I know we're 100%. The momentum, the momentum swings are a lot more prevalent now because you get as we just said you get three or two or three back to back six agains doesn't matter how good your D is it's hard to tackle yeah. um, but I still think if you watch the last three four years the best defensive teams are still yeah. Penrith's 100% the best defensive team we've seen in the last 15 mm. years and they're winning comps every year so um, it's still definitely a, a defence focus but as you said I, I don't mind I don't mind the fact that the game's opening up a little bit more because you speak about the Dragons teams, but maybe I've got a bit of resentment because they beat us in that grand final, but you couldn't breathe. Like, they would just choke you and you had nowhere to play. So I can understand from a spectator's point of view, 
and it, as a half, you, you, you get a bit more momentum with the six again rules, but you don't want the game to turn into touch footy. Yeah. Well, that's my thing with it. I think it's like, like the, from a team perspective and players' perspective, defence is the thing, but the NRL as an organisation is trying to open up the attack so much more. Yeah. And I think sometimes it, the, the, the rule changes every year blow like make fans really frustrated yeah. everyone like, like that six the short dropout rule actually like I'm pretty active on social media I've said it before like as soon as I announce that rule in the NRL subreddit not a single one of the fans that comments on it yeah. agreed with it nobody yeah. liked it yeah, right. um, and normally on in the internet you know comment sections are just full of arguments and I've said before like that the reddit post for that rule change people were only arguing about crap like punctuation yeah. But everyone was like, I agree, I hate this rule change. Also, you forgot a full stop here. Because <laughs> <laughs> they want to argue. Yeah. But they couldn't they couldn't disagree over the rule change. And so yeah, like There I is just, a lot of rules getting changed. Yeah, I think What else did they bring in this year? The dropout? What else uh, they well they did the emph- they've done the emphasis on the um the blockers, uh, the, the, the... What's that? The, oh, the marker. The yeah, marker yeah, was yeah. a big one. Yeah, yeah. The, the blockers who, um, yeah, who stop the defence coming in on a kicker. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, really that's well. an area of yeah. focus. Have you seen the Penrith one? The, the he runs, the hooker yeah. runs. No, instead of... Because you're not allowed to stand still, right, anymore. That's the that's the change to the rule. He know? runes into him as he so passes. He, he, as he passes, he runs. Yeah, right. You know, what's his name? Kenny. He runs, yeah. and it cause, still causes a block, but it's not breaking the rules. Yeah, well, smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, teams are always going to come up with new ways, aren't they? Dude? Yeah. It's, mm. it's clever. That's the, the part of the game of, of evolution. You're always going to come up with ways to capitalize on the rule changes or mm. whatever the rule is to to, to get the win. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the game's in a good place. There's plenty of. Um, good footy played and like I said it's way more open and the players are way bigger but as we spoke about earlier I'd, I'd like to just see some more halves and, and some mm. genuine good style of footy consistently across all the teams because it's hurting a lot of teams yeah the, um, the, when you say the games the games like, but actually like I've found a lot of matches this year have been like from an outsider looking in, it's like semi-final intensity type thing going on every week this this year. Yep. So like that um, uh, Brisbane game on the weekend, that was such a good game of football. It was so intense and yeah, so yeah, fast. Yeah. Um, there was the Parramatta and the West Tigers game yeah. a couple of weeks ago. That was so Ooh, intense, God. so fast, so good. Yep. Um, I don't know how all the teams are going to keep it up for the whole year though. Yeah, <laughs> and injuries too, like when it's yes. that quick. Yeah, soft was, tissue injuries must once, <laughs> once the boys get more fatigued but it was, the it crowds was, are being good too though That's yeah been the crowds the and ratings like, best ever went to Allianz at the Allianz Stadium there a few times that's like European sport there now that's a good Have stadium they've done yeah. it all up yeah, yeah. it's so good now it's good to watch I still there. like um, Combank better out of all the stadiums now I like Combank a lot Combank um, yeah I re- it's around the corner from my house yeah, so yeah, <laughs> so yeah, maybe yeah. the travel has a lot to do with <laughs> but yeah I love Combank and then I went, when I went to Allianz I was like the, the Combank and Allianz are the two stadiums that everyone should model themselves after now in Australia. Yeah, definitely. If they're going to do remodelling, they've got to be like that level, that definitely. standard. Yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like the teams with the, the advantage that the teams with the strong defence have is that they can take more risks in attack as well. The, the, ha- having the really strong defence frees them up in attack because they know they can back their defence if they make a mistake, whereas the teams that, that struggle in defence... Um, that they can't take as many risks in attack because they're worried about having to defend and having their defence exposed. Definitely. Um, the best teams I've been in at the Roosters, it was just everything was about defence. So where you kick the ball was about... Or even the way you attack, you got to you got to ask questions, but your, your attack was built off where we're going to put the opposition mm. to make our defence better. Mm. Um, and that's the mentality of your Penrith um, Broncos at not always consistent with that, but that you can tell that's their mindset off the back of Adam Reynolds' kicking game. Um, and, and historically, of all the grand finals that are played, every team that usually wins a comp, Melbourne set the trend with that. Their mindset is that. You attack to put the team, the opposition, in, a, in, a, in an ordinary position so that your defence can capitalise. Um, so, yeah, the teams that are down the bottom of the ladder, um, whether it comes from coaching or culture within their club are generally the sides that are not thinking that way and it affects you as you said in big games you can't win a big game you look at origins uh test match finals all these games they're one off the back of effort areas and defense and that's the only way to win a, a competition yeah 100 percent. just before i move on to our next item on the run down that that short dropout that's obviously been in focus a lot this year we, we 
with the new rule that's been brought in, is that a difficult kick to execute? Uh, the, the, it, it looks, obviously, I, I didn't play in the NRL, but it just looks like, um, you know, getting it to go 10, getting it to go high enough so that um, a chaser can come through and, and gather it. Seems like it'd be really difficult to pull that one off. Yeah, it's a tough kick. Yeah. Um, there's some some players that you see. I see Latrell cops a lot of criticism. He he sort of nails them quite well. He gets a lot of height on it. Adam Reynolds got a great great kick there on them. Nathan Cleary. But yeah, you're right. It's a it's a hard kick to kick. You know, mm. you haven't got too much room for error. You probably got you know half a metre that you want it to land outside that, that 10 metre meter mark there. Mm. Um, it's a difficult kick, especially if there's a bit of breeze. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, But as I said before, I can see the benefit in, in, in getting the ball back there, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's... Yeah, I don't mind that rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. Respectfully disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing, you sort of got to land it on a 20 cent piece, don't you? You can't kick it too far because your chasers won't get to it. So it's you a see, really, um, it is a tough you've kick. You've just got very low margin for error on that kick. You can well, tell about in general, especially if there's a bit of wind. It's a tough yeah. kick. Yeah. Like uh, Pappenhausen and Xavier Coates have obviously practiced it all the off-season. They're so good at it. I reckon they're the best in the league at it. Yep. Pappenhausen is doing the dropouts and landing it exactly on that 20 cent piece and Coates is jumping and getting it. How big is Oh, yeah, <laughs> he can jump so high. I met uh, Saab the other day from Manly. Oh god, he's a I ran into him in a cafe. Man, he's massive. <laughs> I knew he was big watching him on TV and stuff, but he's an animal. Yeah, like, fast, big, strong. That's those outside backs that we were talking about. But um, really nice guy too. Him. Yeah, they're all so huge, but they're also nice. Yeah, <laughs> nice off the field. Yeah, not, not good when they got their elbows. In the it's back of the head, they back off kick returns. But <laughs> the outside backs in the game now are unbelievable. Aren't yeah, hundred percent. The ability to be able to get up in the air and um, they t- they change. They, honestly, your wingers can be your best players now. Yeah, like, the amount of work that they get through, the amount of carries that they take, defensive reads as well. The amount of attack that goes down those edges with speed. Like your wingers need to be on every play of the game. Yeah, well, Zach Lomax, it probably wasn't like that 10, 20, 30 no. years ago. Zach Lomax is the best player of the Dragons at the moment. Yeah, even though he's a centre playing a wing. But yeah. yeah, he's the best player at the Dragons right now. Yeah. He's yeah, amazing. He's quality. Yeah. Um, just moving this one along, um, I was going to ask you how you found your, your two seasons with the Catalans over in the Super League. That's my team, by the way. You the like the Catalans? Yeah. yeah but, um, <laughs> get, get, get into that grand final last year, right. of course, and that that experience again, probably another. You know, you probably enjoyed um, n- not having the scrutiny that you had in Australia, just um, escaping to, to France. Um, I'm guessing you could live in relative anonymity over there compared yeah. to what you did here. Yeah, I'm, I'm half French now. That's how much love I got for the place. France, um, honestly, it was the best thing I've, I've ever done, I think. Um, that's not taking away anything before. It wouldn't probably be the best thing I've ever done if I hadn't had the career I had here before. But having been happy with... Um, my time in the NRL and, and I felt like it was my time ready to move on. It was the best thing I did, um, getting out of the same environment. Um, living in the south of France isn't a bad lifestyle, that's for sure. Uh, plenty of travel. Um, and the team itself, the club's a really good club over there. Um, if you're going to go to Super League, you want to go to a, a top four side mm. because yeah, it's your best chance of having some success. Um, and yeah, I, I had such a good time. Met some of my, my best guys I call my best mates now. I spent quality two years away from home and um, yeah, built some really good friendships and yeah, just enjoyed the whole experience. <clears throat> Fell short in the grand final. I actually did my hamstring um, the, the last final. So I played the, the two finals with a, with a bit of a bad hammy and I, I couldn't kick. So... Uh, it was one of those ones where you don't want to miss a grand final, but yeah. we had to manage around the kicking and I ended up doing it again late in the game. So that was really disappointing because, you know, to be able to be a part of the Catalans first premiership would have been something that uh, would have been one of the highlights of my life, to be honest. It's, it's such a proud area there, but um, the club's in a really good spot and they're going well, going well again this year. So, And to play at Old Trafford was pretty cool too. Have you ever been there? No. no, no unbelievable no. stadium. Unbelievable stadium and... The history is like you play, you talk about the Australian stadiums and all the, the stadiums in Europe, but you walk in there and like you can feel the legends like Beckham and mm. all these guys. I don't know, it's just something different that place. It was, uh, that was something I'll always tell my kids about of playing there. Yeah, um, what, what was it? What were the main differences in terms of um, the play over there in the Super League compared with the NRL? Um, yeah, it's it's, it's different, it's 100%. Um, a different style 
consistently week to week. Like the bottom sides is a big difference. Mm. Um, in saying that, the top sides, Wigan, St. Helens, well, Catalans, um, they're tough games of footy. And, and it's ref different over there. Mm. Um, if you play in the wet early in the season, it's, it's very damp. Um, the refs allow a lot more wrestle. Like people speak about how much more open the game is. When I was there, I experienced when I was playing Wigan and St. Helens, it's, it's, it's a slower ruck. Mm. It's really hard to get momentum when the, when the refs are a bit against you and uh, you're playing in the wet. So you've got to adapt your style a little bit. Um, and over in the NRL, you probably haven't got the same size. We just spoke about the size of outside backs here. Across the quality of the players in, in most teams, you haven't got the size as big. So physically, it's it's a bit probably not as physical week to week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult at the same time to go over the first year because you, you adapt into a new style. Uh, a lot of players from Australia struggle their first years over there or don't play their best footy because you, you, it's just a different environment, different players, coached a bit different. So, But I, I love the game over there and um, there's so many good players there. Like People sort of like to, to put the NRL on a pedestal here in Super League here and understandably the, the quality here is probably a lot better across the board, but there's so many really good players there. I'd love to see more younger English guys come out here and be able to be a part of a development system in NRL and get that kind of coaching with the professionalism we have here because I think you'll see... Some really good players come out of there. And, and maybe some of these NRL clubs who are struggling a bit with their recruitment, they should maybe look to England and definitely and look at some options over there Yeah, um, if they're struggling to to fill the gaps here. Yeah, well, I think this, yeah, like you see that some of those lo- lower sides that probably don't have the same money in and around the clubs, um, the same professionalism, mm. the, the younger guys there aren't getting the same coaching that a, a, a kid that's getting... The development obviously in an NRL system so I'd love to see them bringing out and trusting in these players development from England uh, I think it'll only help the NRL that's for sure this is Matty John said the um, NRL should buy the Super League and yeah. then you'd be able to have crossovers between them both um, and that'd help both systems actually mm. um, Ricky Stewart's recruiting a lot of players from England actually because yeah. he couldn't get anyone to go to Canberra yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's done a good job with all the players. Yeah. Like Smithers that's there, the lock at the moment. He's a qu- He was one of Wigan's best players. Yeah. Um, had a big rap on him when we played against against them over there. And he's been one of their best players at the start of the year for Canberra. Bateman. Um, yeah, yeah, like Bateman. Those top sides over there, the St. Helens and Wigan, they're very professional clubs. And all their players are top shelf players mm. um, that would, would all go really well in the NRL. Mm. Yeah, the Canberra cold is not exactly going to scare English players away, is it? Yeah. Compared to what they have to deal with all the time. Yeah. Um, just moving along, I was going to talk to you a bit about your state of origin career. Now, you seem to cop a lot of very harsh criticism in the early part of it. You were going up against the likes of Thurston, Slater, Cronk, Inglis, Cameron Smith, Darren Lockyer. Yeah. Um, and, and you seem to cop it a fair bit, but then we get to 2019 and you come in for the injured Nathan Cleary and that decider and, and you turn it on and set up that last winning try to Tedesco. Can you just sort of just describe that feeling? Obviously, you would have been over the moon. Oh, yeah, that feeling was unreal. Um, I'm the first to say my, my origin career was a roller coaster. Um, and I think back now I'm retired and I look back and it was, it was, it was a roller coaster. Um, um, but yeah, to come back in 2019 um, was uh, was a pretty special feeling, and one of the like I spoke about the 13 grand final, um, the 19 was was one of the same sort of feelings that I'll always hold close to my heart. And uh, it went down to the wire. I was a bit nervous there with about two minutes to go. We we're well and truly in front, as as everyone that watched the game, we we're well and truly in front. And then they had a couple of charge down. I think Jimmy <laughs> kicked the ball. Late in the game, got charged down, and then when they scored that last one, I remember going to Jimmy behind the ga- uh, behind the line. I said, "Mate, fuck, we need to win this, man. <laughs> <laughs> My life depends on this, man." <laughs> um, and then, yeah, when it all worked out in the end, um, big turbo and, and Fergie, and then Teddy there at the end. Like, um, yeah, I was pretty over the moon about that. Yeah, and your dad was there as well, wasn't he, that night at, at the game? Yeah, 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 so you got to share the moment with him as well. Yeah, they weren't going to miss that one. They were there through the, the wins and the losses and the goods and the bad, so the opportunity to win the series there, they weren't going to miss that one. And, um, yeah, look, those moments. I remember going in the sheds after, and honestly, when I played through and I spoke about a roller coaster, um, as a competitor and a, as a player, um, 
you say all this criticism, but we care what we care letting people down, and that's the thing. Like those, it never feels good to lose series. Um, so the feeling of relief and seeing everyone happy when you win, and even happy for me, like just to see everyone else happy in the sheds after a game, that was that was the best feeling about it because you're not playing for yourself in Origin. You're playing for everyone that's passionate, and that comes with happiness and sadness when you lose and criticism and you understand all that. I'm not delusional about that as a player. So when you go in and you have that series win and see how happy everyone is and wake up the next day and, and the whole of New South Wales happy, you know, that's there's no better feeling than that. Yeah, we were happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the greatest and best thing ever, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, oh, my, my best friend Seth, shout out to Seth, is a massive Roosters fan. You were, he's... One of his favourite players of all time, and then I was watching it with him, and he was just like, "Come on, Bessie!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, crazy, like so. It was a good time. I loved it so much. It was such. A, it was, I, I always remember. Like that's one of those ones as yeah. a fan watching. That's one of those moments we'll always remember. Like when Piercy got his Origin win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good. Mate, because that, it was. Um, I remember going into that series to the decide. I was playing really good footy, but naturally I was nervous. You know, mm-hmm. I was I was in a confident place. So I knew I'd play good footy. <laughs> it was going to be bigger than just playing good footy. Yeah. Like, like, we had to win. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, you know, it all worked out in yeah. the end. And, um, yeah, something that I'll always remember. And it was a great group of players too. And, and, and I had always had a really good relationship with Freddie. And, and for him to get me back, we had a pretty special sort of moment after where we, we had a big cuddle and um, just that, that feeling that you get. Um, and he was a big part of my career and always believed in me even when we were losing. And... Um, so yeah, to experience it with him and then all the boys that were in that side is um, something I'll always remember. Yeah. What do you think our chances are this year? <laughs> um, I think we'll go good. I think the last couple of series, every series, that's the thing I always say to people. Like even when we were going through all those losses, like there's a there's a pass or a moment in every one of those series where if it had gone different, and we weren't good enough, mm. never making an excuse, they were, they iced those moments better, but. If, if some of those moments go different, it's a different story. And it's no different to the last couple of series with New South Wales. So, um, yeah, it's a bounce of the ball and, and, it's, and that's the best players stepping up. So New South Wales is just a good a chance again as Queensland this year. Yeah, 100%. I was just going to move this on to um, your thoughts on, on, on the current Roosters side. Having a little bit of a struggle to start the season, two wins, three losses. They're just outside the top eight at the moment. Um what, what are your thoughts on how they're sort of travelling and, and how do you think they'll go this season? I went to the South game, the first game they played, I think it was after the Vegas game back in Sydney. Uh, it was my first game back at Allianz, so it was a good, good experience. Going, to, I went for Jared's 300th yep. and they were unbelievable that night, the Roosters. like They just bashed South off the field. Obviously, South, in hindsight now, were going through a bit of a form slump. Uh, but they looked powerful, big, well-organised. Um, <clears throat> then I went to the Penrith game the week after and they obviously... Got outplayed there, and then and then had the poor f- performance against the Dogs. Um, I think the Roosters will be thereabouts. Um, they'll be right up there. I think they just got to keep everyone healthy. Last week was difficult. They obviously had the send-offs, uh, the concussion with Teddy. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're definitely thereabouts. Um, when I've, whenever I've been involved with the Roosters and, and then watching them since I've left, uh, everything's built off the back of their defence. That's what they pride themselves on. That's what they're usually better at than most sides. And they need to get back to that. Uh, if they do that right, um, they've got the players across the board to come up with big moments. Uh, but they'd, I'm sure they'd be very disappointed because that Dogs game last week, they were, the first half was, was unusual. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a rooster <laughs> style. It was, it was really weird. Um, and coming off the Penrith loss, um, I thought their start might have been better, but I'm sure they're all over that. And I'm looking forward to the game. Um, Against Newcastle, I think um, both yeah, sides. You, you, Newcastle, you're two former clubs. Two former going sides. Yeah, where, I wish. Where, I, wish where, I could. where does your heart lie with that one? You, you oh, don't say this to me. Put it on the internet. Tag <laughs> Newcastle. <laughs> tag the Roosters. Yeah. <laughs> I just point. love Donald. To be honest, yeah. when you retire, you enjoy just watching footy. Like you haven't really ever slowed down in 18 years just to watch footy. Ever since I was. A kid before you debut, you, you, it's hard to watch when you're a player without being competitive. Like watching a game, I hardly watch games in the end. I just do a review and 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 this 
analyzing type of thing away from it because to watch a game where you just get so competitive and you're thinking about ways that you can win and how you're going to inject yourself so it's nice just to relax now and actually admire the players and then see it from a different perspective so I'm enjoying it so far so you're hoping for a draw tonight um, it's tonight right it's tonight be good if it's a close game <laughs> I, I think Roosters will get up to be honest um, I think they need to get up I'm coming yeah. off two losses and the quality that they got but uh, Newcastle's sort of backs against the wall again uh, a bit as well like they've come off if they had a loss last week they were 4 and 1 1 and 4 um, you know 1 win 4 losses if they had a loss last week they managed a good win but then they're on that tipping edge again now if they lose this week then that roller coaster starts again so I'm interested to see how, how it pans out yeah, they just seem to have one of those nights against the Bulldogs didn't they Tedesco and Walker off for HIAs and you had Young sent off and Radley sin being it's just yeah. Yeah. everything just went against them the dogs against played the well dogs. too though didn't they they, they did like, yeah, they yeah they, 40 minutes yeah they did, they did. That's, yeah. The best, that's the best they've attacked in a while in that first half they, yeah. they look like they we talked before about teams being too structured. They look like they, they freed themselves up and kick out was just on fire. Well, I've got a big rap on Seraldo, the coach. I've had a little bit to do with him. Um, a really good fella, but I reckon he's the sort of coach we spoke about before <coughs> of coach, coaches adapting to what you've got. It'll take him a bit of time, but I reckon he's a coach that is smart enough to, to adapt with the roster. And I think once he starts to get Burton and Crichton and these type of guys implementing what they see, I reckon we'll start to see dogs come through with a bit of a wave mid-season this week they named Crichton at fullback which everyone every Bulldogs fan has mm. wanted yeah. with Blake Tuff yeah. how good yeah. T.A. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but they, they got that with those players they've got like Crichton's a winner and he's not used to losing so he'll bring a real once he gets he injects himself into that team he'll bring that confidence onto the other group mm. uh, onto the rest of the group uh, they haven't really had someone like him the last couple of years have they no. you know that out and out winner rep player yeah, Burton's got it in him, but he looks a bit more of an introvert type of kid. So um, I think once they get... Yeah, I reckon Crichton's a big one for him to give them that confidence. And, and at fullback, he's able to inject himself. Yeah. And it's a pity Addo Carr has had a couple of injury concerns as well to start the season. It'd be good to see him get a real stretch of games and, and get some form up as well. Yeah, big time. And um, look, they've got the roster there, and I think they'll be a club. You've got that feeling that in the next couple of years, they'll definitely get there. They, um, they've got the right framework there. Uh, and I want the dogs to do well, you know, as a, as a, as a fan now. Um, it's a proud club and you mm. want the dogs to do well. It's, it's not good seeing the Bulldogs with the area that they've got and yeah. all the fan base. You don't want to see them down the bottom too long. So I'm sure they'll find their way back up. Yeah, it's a big supported club in Sydney and it's, yeah. it's good for the game when they're doing well, for sure. Definitely. Um, it's just Good you know, for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to live in Bill Moore. I was there in their last grand final appearance. When I was there, was that one? That was the Melbourne one when James Graham. Oh, the... That was terrible. Like I lived in Bill Moore yeah. in that grand final appearance. That was I've never seen anything like the crowd and the. Yeah. I, I was like, I said, we had to go That's pick it. It was crazy. Like I had to go pick up some sausages, and yeah. I, it was just two minutes down the road. It took me two hours. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Were, you there, <laughs> were, you, were you there when they played Souths in fourteen in the grand finals? It would have been similar. Mm. Would have been even, even more that week playing against another Sydney club. I can't, that's one I can't remember. I just know I was there for the moment against Melbourne when yeah. James Graham beat Billy Slater's here. Was it who was it? Two thousand and nine. They played as well when Para made the grand final. Oh no, so that, that was, was the, the that storm. Was that was when the was storm. Was about eighty thousand or seventy. Oh yeah, 000. in the prelim. In the prelim, yeah, it, was, it was like seventy four thousand in the prelim. That was Bulldogs Parramatta. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And yeah, it was, that was about seventy thousand at the prelim. And yeah, if it was like an Origin game. I remember and if it. it wasn't for Jared Hain absolutely catching fire in the back end of 09, that they might have just made that grand would, final yeah. too. I remember Mort's little Mort's got a try and Fui Fui Moi Moi. That was that game. Yeah, yeah. I was there. Yeah, that game. Yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. the atmosphere was unbelievable. Oh, yeah, it was a yeah, pity we didn't get the result, but, yeah, the atmosphere was yeah. incredible. And then they, they played another prelim against Souths in 2012 there. They got over 70,000. Oh, right. So they were two sort of huge Sydney finals games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be nice to see them against them. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I was just going to go. We, we do this segment, Mitch. It's called um, Honestly, Guys. It's just our opinion. And yeah. today, I, I thought we sorry about that. Yeah, I thought we would just focus on um, your, your former teammate, Latrell Mitchell. Unfortunately, he's been suspended for that elbow on Sean Johnson. Um, just seems like a, um, there's something happening every week with Latrell at the moment. There's a drama every week. Um, well, well, what are your thoughts on him as, as a former teammate and, and what do you think he needs to do to get back to that um, 
that that good solid form that we all we all know him for. Yeah, well, it's disappointing, isn't it? Because you know everyone has a high high respect for Latrell as a player. And when I played with Latrell when he was when he was a young guy, I had a great relationship with him. Um, and all his old teammates when he was at the Roosters, from from all I've heard, his, his compliments on the guy. He's um, got a lot of respect in and around the players when he's playing his best footy. But at the moment, it's hard to say he's not letting himself down and everyone around him. Um, and it's disappointing to watch because <clears throat> he looks like he's crying out for something, a bit of help at the moment. Obviously, the radio um, drama and then mm. a few actions. It just looks like someone who's a bit unhappy. And it, it's, it's not good to see because you want Latrell playing his best footy. And, and, and as an old teammate, I want, you, want, you want to see Latrell happy. Um, I think everyone in the game wants that. So it's, it's a hard one with South what's going on there because... It's not like they've come off a really bad year last year or the year before. They all seem pretty connected from, from my point of view, from watching. Um, so there's obviously some issues, whether it's the coach or whether it's something inside, but they need to get on get on top of it uh, fast. I saw you last night something about Mal Meninga. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, if they get Mal there, he just, he just makes everything good Mal, doesn't he? What a legend. So, um, yeah, I'm sure it's... Latrell will find, find his way back. It's just um, they need to find it fast. Yeah, I think Demetrio, that's not something Demetrio would have liked to have seen, though, would he? I mean, those headlines that, that they're looking at, at Mal Meninga as an interim coach, I mean, he, he's, uh. you know, he, he's still in the job there now. I think if Demetrio had seen those headlines, he'd be pretty he'd be pretty upset about it, I would have thought. Yeah, well, it's just hard to sort of get a grip of what's happening there yeah. because um, nothing's really, no one's really said anything, have they? That's the thing. Like, from South. From yeah, South, nothing. yeah. That's the thing with, from an ex-player or a teammate we just spoke about, I spoke about with Latrell. Like, you'd think some senior players would come out and just say, look, nah, we're all solid, we're all together, or this is the problem. Like, no one's really come out and said anything, which is strange. Um, you'd like to think, as a player, if you're in that position, you, you, your brothers you're running out with are coming out and backing you up. So maybe there is a problem there. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, they need to get on top of it fast. As I said, two reasons, because the quality of what Latrell brings to their team and the quality of what a player he is, you want to see him playing his best footy for the game. Yeah, 100%. Um, just finally, I was just going to ask you if there's anything you sort of like or dislike most about the game at the moment. Is there one thing that you really like about the game at the moment? And then after that, I'll ask, is there one thing you... You, you dislike about the game at the moment? Um, the thing I like is the crowds. Um, just coming back from, from overseas. Um, like I think that's one thing that um, overseas sport or AFL, for instance, have maybe got our measure a little bit. Yeah. Consistently getting big crowds. But a couple of games I've gone to and then commentated, like the atmosphere is unreal. And with the way the game is now in Australia, it's, it's our major sport through all the papers and everything like that. You want to see people turning up to the game. So, And as a player, like there's nothing better than going out there and, and getting a full crowd of support. So that's what I'm happy with as far as the, the spectacle. Yep. Anything that you, you, you think the game could do better that you sort of dislike about the game at the moment? Um... Maybe we, sp- we spoke about the halves, the lack of halves. We keep yeah. talking about it. Maybe mm. I need to stop talking about it. But uh, no, I think everyone needs to talk about it more because it's it's it's, it's really affects the game. I think like yeah. the fact that there's so few superstar halves yeah. for the, from the fans' perspective. Yeah. So like well, I said, so the fans talk about it. A yeah, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, on the yeah, internet, yeah. Like I always say in this podcast, like the NRL should jump on Reddit. Reddit is your best place to actually see fan sentiment, especially in the NRL one. Because if you haven't used Reddit, like the way Reddit works is, I can create a post and everyone can comment on it. Yeah. But in the NRL subreddit and the AFL one, you're not allowed to create posts. You can only publish news articles and then they have one specific thread that you can just make random statements. So all it is is all day, every day, news articles get published and everyone talks about it. And you can see the real sentiment there about things. And people talk about the halves a lot. Like I said, with the the 10 metre dropout rule, all the sentiment was negative about it, like 100%. I even went there and asked, like, does anyone support this? And everyone said, no. Yeah, right. (laughs) But, like, the, yeah, the halves is, like, really talked about, especially when you have things like, if Panthers play the Bulldogs, you're going to have Nathan Cleary and Jerome Jerome Luai against. Matt Burton and I don't know who their halfback is now. Hutchison. Um, Hutchison, yeah. yeah. And people will go, like, the halves uh, imbalance is so bad, especially, like, people who are like me, you know, like 40 years old. They'll go, in the old days, you'd see Nathan Cleary and Jerome um, Luai against Mitchell Pearce and Todd Carney. Yeah. 
You know, we don't. You see that week in, week out, and like it's only ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. See it week yeah. in, week out. Two superstar yeah. house combinations. Well, the thing is, it's probably hard for fans, and, and like we just said, then because if the game's in an arm wrestle and it's going to come down to your kicking game, you sort of know who's going to win it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly and that's, right. And that's the disadvantage to the to the sides because a lot of the sides, like we just kept saying, good outside backs, good forward packs, great centers, majority of the teams. Like, there's big athletes mm-hmm. everywhere, and it does come down to that. Um, that's the beauty of obviously why Naif's on a big paycheck and he's and he's winning premierships because he's the man. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't have Nathan Cleary in every team. It's like when Andrew Johns and Lockyer were playing, they're, they're the best because they're the best. But, yeah, it, 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 from you asked me what I don't like about it, yeah, just getting that more quality across the board in and around the style of footy because I think some teams are boring to watch um, mm. and that's probably a, a bit of a reason with the personnel but you know, I really, I, from a, from a spectator point of view, now I love watching Penrith. I love watching the Roosters. I love watching, you know, these sides mm. that have got quality spine. Um, yeah. Some of these other sides, you're sort of going in, going, well, what are you going to get today? And that's not really great for the spectacle. But what do we do? Yeah, NRL is going to do something. But that's yeah, like yeah. Willie Mason said. You look at the Newcastle spine now. Last year, he had the whole thing with Tyson Gamble, and you got Caelan Ponga and three other guys. Yeah, and that's that's. It was a bit mean for I thought. Willie, I mean, <laughs> Mace, talked, yeah. talked about this. It was yeah, a bit mean. Yeah. Not a fan um, of Tyson Gamble. But um, you know, he pointed it out specifically about Newcastle because it was when Newcastle was in, going into a final, right? But then, like I thought about it at the time, and you look across all of the um, teams, and it's all like that. You got a superstar halfback, yeah. and then three guys in the spine. But then you do have teams like the Panthers. Like Melbourne, Melbourne spine is Melbourne's ridiculous. Real good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Man, Melbourne's another one that'll be right up there. If they yeah. can keep fresh with, he's he's so underrated, Jerome Hughes. Yeah, I reckon. I was talking he tipped to him to miss the eight this well, year. Yeah, <laughs> kidding. Yeah. Uh, well, my mate was talking. Yeah, to I me. wish I could have that over again. <laughs> my best mate loves a footy, and he's he's uh, he's always my go-to guy. I talk to actually, like he's he's very intelligent about footy. But he talked about Jerome Hughes, and he was saying about um, he's he played like three. Three grand finals, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like, he sort of goes under the radar a little bit. Like, his success there, the players he's played with, like, he's had a lot of experience with Billy Slater, Cameron Smith. Like, I don't think he gets enough raps. And I he's proven in big games. Yeah, I always thought, I, I have thought for the past few years, he's very Cooper Cronk esque. And yeah. the only reason, like, you noticed Cooper, noticed Cooper Cronk more was because he got picked in the rep teams, like the State of Origin teams and stuff like yeah. that. But Jerome, I always thought for the past few years, Jerome Hughes has been. Very like at that Cooper Cronk level, you know, because yeah. Cooper Cronk wasn't the most amazing, flashy, X Factor type player, mm. but he was like the perfect halfback, you know. Yeah. Uh, but there's there's different level. Like I think I was actually on the, was on, when I was on the Sunday Footy Show, Billy Slater. It's a good point to what you're saying now. Um, you spoke about Nathan Cleary, maybe not being the most brilliant half he's seen, as in. Skill wise, like he's 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 um brings a lot of other stuff. And Andrew Johns raised it and said, What do you mean by brilliant? Like, it's a good good argument, yeah. isn't it? Because I think Nathan Clear is one of the best I've ever seen. But if you compare his maybe off the cuff flair to a Sean Johnson, if that's what you call brilliant, they're yeah. different. But footy's about winning and getting it done. So, yeah, so you that's when you, saw, you talk about Cooper yeah. with that. Is he as flamboyant as a Sean Johnson and these type of players? No, but. He knows how to get it done and he does the stuff that wins games and brings everyone else in probably better than other players. So yeah, that's it's I a good argument. Jerome yeah. Hughes is like, you know, he's like that. But unfortunately for Jerome Hughes, he doesn't get to play Origin and for Australia and sit outside like all those rep teams, so he doesn't get the recognition. No, nah, you know? yeah. No, yeah. you're right. Probably because with the, with the Origin stuff, he, yeah. Yeah. Not getting the same sort of eyes on him. But yeah, he's a, he's a terrific player. I reckon, I like, because he was out, and they, it was that was he was it was him and Munster were out against Newcastle. I tipped Melbourne to win anyway, but Newcastle beat him. Well, and was you, this, uh, uh, it's just two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah it was too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and they had a young yeah. spine. They had Jonah Peasant there. And yeah, he goes good. Him. Yeah, yeah. He's a good young but player. But it sucks to be have both your halves like, yeah, yeah. when you got Cameron Munster and Jerome Hughes out, and you have to step in for them. <laughs> I've been there. It's a tough, tough job when you're a kid. <laughs> yeah, you need uh, you need to rely on one of those older boys yeah. when you're a young guy. And just that, that growing up watching Alan Langer in the 90s, I mean, he was a player who really just played what he saw, um, played off the cuff a lot of the time. Um, you just feel like uh, halfbacks these days, are just they're just not allowed to play like that anymore. There's just that they, they have to play to a structure and it'd be great to see another Alan Langer type come along and, and, and 
be given the freedom to just play what they see a lot more. I was watching the the Canberra. Was it when when Canberra played Cronulla? Or was it last week? It might have been Canberra Para and Jamal Fogarty pulled off a chip and chase, and we were saying, <laughs> saying it in the commentary. It's the first time I've seen a chip and chase come off or someone back himself. It was like on a third tackle. And it wasn't in a, in a sort of position yeah, where you probably normally it. do it. So it goes back to your question. But I think I think the thing, and I sort of got the back end of this sort of midway through my career, it became a real fear. You had a lot of fear as a half of, of doing the off-the-cuff stuff if it didn't come off because your whole game is built now around, as I spoke about earlier, around defence. So if your mindset or you're the one to let your team down with a bad play or a risk-taking play that leads to a a try from the opposition, there's a big consequences. Um, I don't think when Alfie and that were playing that there was probably the same um, w- focus on that, get kicking into the corner and, and building pressure as much. The game was different. So I reckon that's definitely taken out uh, the instincts. And you can still come off with those ty- plays at the right time as a, as, a, as a half in the NRL now. But it's, as I just said, there's a lot of fear around it because of the, the consequence if you don't see the ball for 10 minutes after. And your kick leads to a try from, from the opposition. But I also think in the juniors now, it's not as de- developed because, uh, as I said before, uh, a lot of the coaching's around structure and playing like an NRL team. So young kids are told to kick to the corner, practice those box kicks, um, build pressure. So you're not really developing that instinct as much. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely all that's contributing to change in the way halves are playing with instinct. So it seems like they're instilling that NRL mentality in these halves far too early and it's restricting yeah. their their freedom to play what they yeah. see. The other thing with the chip and chase too, like how often does it come off? <laughs> well, well, we Chris want to, we want to see it. I think fans say that. I want to see it. Chris Sando was the best at it. Yeah. <laughs> and I played with Chris Sando, Australian schoolboys, and I saw him. It was the best thing I've ever seen. He scored. He kicked two chip and chases to score. So he, scored, <laughs> he was 40 out from the trot. He was the best yeah. junior I've nearly seen. We played in the halves together. I was playing 5'8 at that age um, when, when I played with him. We were going in and out, but he was my half when we played on the tour. And he was doing this in the Queensland New South Wales tours, like he was chip and chasing every every game in rep footy and coming yeah. off. He scored this one. Honestly, we we're forty meters out. We we're playing against England in 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 somewhere in north of England, and he went forty out from the trial and attacking. Went over one, then came to the fullback. Went over again. <laughs> <laughs> like I'd love to get footage of it. There wouldn't be ever any footage, but I tell everyone about that. It yeah, was the, the best. That was so cool. When he <laughs> used to do that, like it was. Oh mate! It, but it, it, oh, oh yeah, like he said, you know, how often do you see it come off? And he'd do a chip and chase, and it wouldn't come off, and then they'd have to de- defend the set out and well, stuff. Well, it's a negative play. You're not going to get compliments from your coach, teammates, or the commentary after if yeah. it doesn't come off. <laughs> They're going to be talking about how poor the kick was. So and it's, it's a hard one, isn't it? Like Alfie and that made a career off it and then everyone yeah. loved it but if you did that now and it didn't come off you're a bit of a villain so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shifty Sherwin was good at he the was chip good. and chase too and good at the little grubbers in behind the line as well his kicking yeah. game is one of the best yeah he, he, he's an underrated player isn't he he doesn't get the raps he, he deserves he's rarely talked about now but yeah. had a lot to do with that See, another one in success that. in the early 2000s he's another one in that period where the, every high every team yeah. had a superstar if, if, if he was, well he went head to head with most like even with Joey and these guys yeah. at club club yeah. games when the dogs were really good he yeah. was like Freddie and that were in the opposition against them but he, like he was one of the best players if he was playing now he'd probably be on over a million a year 100% sure. 100% yeah. he's probably Future kicking though, himself right? <laughs> <laughs> uh. oh I think, yeah, I think that, that's a wrap. Awesome. I think we're all done here. All right, thanks for coming, man. That was great. Good to be on um, board, boys. Just a bit of thanks, housekeeping. Mitch, thanks for coming thanks in, mate. Yeah. Don't forget Cheers. to follow at Smart B app and you can watch Mitchell Pierce congratulate people who win the NRL tipping comp. Don't forget to sign up for the NRL tipping comp. <laughs> Get on, boys, <laughs> and start winning. <laughs> Smash Piercey. <laughs> My um, tips have been all over the shop. Uh, it's terrible. Like, we're, we're so bad. Me and you are really far down the ladder. It's, yeah, like, really bad. <laughs> I'm putting a lot of time and effort into it, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing the commentary. I'm doing the podcast. So it's not like I'm not involved. I'm putting a lot of time and effort into these tipping, so <laughs> but don't don't follow his tips. Yeah. <laughs> or mine. It's or long mine. Year. Yeah, don't worry. I plan to catch up. That's the plan. Yeah, like, that's I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come off. At the moment, I'm in the. Do you bet on the of... AFL as well? Tipping on the AFL? No, nah, I don't know because it's. I don't have time to watch. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, I can't get invested. Who's winning the AFL at the moment? Um, um, I looked it up. This oh, morning. I'll look it up for you. I right looked it up now. this morning, man. Um, I know the Swans are going well. 
Yeah. We don't cover that. <laughs> Might be the closely, Lions. But I'll check it out for you. Yeah, I don't want to say anything because. But I looked it up this GWS morning. GWS. Oh yeah, that's right. GWS yeah, yeah. on top. But there's a yeah. whole bunch of clubs on 16 points. Yeah. Top five are on 16 points. GWS, Melbourne, Sydney, Carlton, Geelong. Yeah, I know because I follow Sydney. I know they. I follow their things. I watch them when I can, but. Um, I could have go to a GWS. GWS, yeah. yeah. I'd love to go to a Swans game this year. Never really went when I was in Sydney. It's really. Have you been to AFL games before? It's I went weird. to a grand final in Melbourne. I find it weird because you know they have the quarters. People leave their seats like five minutes before a quarter. The finishes and yeah. then come back five minutes afterwards. Oh, yeah. And I kept Drink asking break. people when I was there, "Where are you going, man? The games on there. Like, gotta go line up for drinks." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's four times, you know. So ninety thousand. So yeah, at I was stadium, at a, so get massive crowd. I was at a SCG game with the Swans. Uh, I can't even remember who was the opposition, but it was sold out. It was like middle of the season, like yeah. sold out. But yeah. my sister has memberships, so she sent us the memberships. But yeah, they get the crowds are crazy. Yeah. But it's it, look, you know. AFL, if you follow AFL a lot, it's way better at the game than it is on TV. Yeah, right. way better because it's like soccer. Yeah, you know, you, you off the ball. Yeah, it's yeah, the all TV about off the ball. Can't yeah, keep yeah. up with the ball. It's all about yeah. what's happening off the ball. They do so many kilometers too. Yeah, like the, yeah. well, their their top players are running like. 15, 16, 17 yeah, k's. Yeah, yeah. 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 sometimes Midfield, probably more. Yeah. Mid 20, yeah. 22. Yeah. They used to train. When we were at the Roosters, the Swans train next to us, so we used to see them a fair bit, and they'd be doing like the one point two time trial. Like in NRL, you might do one once a week. You sometimes I don't even know if the boys do it that often anymore. They do like four in one session. <laughs> so like we, you'd be doing it, like we, and then our session would be finished, and they're still running them. Oh my god! And that was like an easy day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to run across the road, man. Oh <laughs> yeah. wait, it's a tough fine. sport. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. But yeah, all right. Well, thanks a lot, man. And we'll have you on another time further through. You see how the roosters are going, and that was awesome. Sounds good. Thanks, boys. Thanks, Rich.